Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, January the... No, Tuesday, January the 6th. We've changed our filming date, so it's Tuesday now, January the 6th, in the beautiful Memorial Arena in uh, downtown Victoria. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes the show happen. Um, the first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show, and we're going to start off just with a column by Les Lane. Les Lane, I think, is the main political writer for the Times Colonist, our daily newspaper here in Victoria. And um, he's been around for a long time. And he's talking about electoral reform, which is something that for me and I think for democracy is very important because we have, we have a voting system, believe it or not, because we, we never hear about this, a voting system is very important. And the kind of voting system that a country has is very important for what that country becomes. And if we could have a better and more democratic voting system, then we could become a better and more democratic country. It is important. So this is what Les Lane, because the NDP is putting forward an idea of moving towards proportional representation. So Les Lane says, this is a dark path into the deep forest. When it comes to layers upon layers of complexity and cascading series of unintended consequences, electoral reform is the pinnacle. It's also good at inducing pounding headaches, making people's eyes glaze over, and emptying rooms of all but the most devout students of voting systems. So, this is what the corporate media, owned by Corporate Canada, who controls our country in part because our voting system isn't good, this is what Corporate Canada chooses to tell us about electoral reform. And the problem with the corporations owning the media is that any politician who thinks that electoral reform is important looks at something like this and says, you know, they're going to kill us on yeah. this. And so it they move away from it. This is how the media controls and manipulates our politicians. I mean, there's many other ways the media does it, but, but that's one. Um, it's unfortunate that, I mean, we've had two referendums here on proportional representation. In both of them, I would say the media really, really failed us. They really failed us by not really talking about the issues and not giving us the information we needed to make an intelligent and informed decision. And it, it's, it's killing us as a country. It's killing us as a country to have a media that's everything. I mean, you know, who owns the media in Canada? It's six or seven giant corporations. Bell Media is maybe the biggest. Shaw is big. Post Media owns daily newspapers everywhere. The Globe and Mail is owned by Canada's richest family, the Thompsons. They also own the Reuters news agency. Chorus Radio is big and in Quebec everything is Quebec core. These are the corporations that own all the media in the country and we can't beat them as long as as they have that power. Well it's a problem <laughs> isn't it Jack? But, you know 57.2 percent of British Columbians want it wanted electoral reform in the referendum in 2006. That sounds like a majority to me. That's right. I don't think we have to review this anymore. I think the NDP, if they had any, what, courage, any brains, perhaps, would say, if you elect us, we're going to reform how we're, pe we're electing people in this province to proven, go to a proven method in other countries that does allow <coughs> more democracy. So. I disagree with you. I think I, I like the approach the provincial NDP is taking. You do? Or, or the, the approach the federal and no, the provincial NDP, which is going to be a referendum. I think it's important what to What do you have to learn, people, Jack? We already, we already know. That. Well, I, I think it's, it's an important issue. I think people have the right to say yes or no. I think people have the right to say yes or no on a lot of issues. And, and this is one. I mean, why isn't there a referendum on Site C? Exactly. You know? okay. Why isn't there a referendum on genetically engineered foods? Yeah. Why isn't there a referendum on the fact that the corporations and the governments are deliberately creating homelessness in our country and poverty? Why isn't there a referendum on that? 
All you have to do is do some polling, and you'll find there's a huge support for electoral reform. But, but nevertheless, look, if the NDP wants to go with that, that's just their standard procedure. It's, it's a milk toast thing. You can't sink your teeth into it. It doesn't fire me up to want to vote for them. And, and, and I'm a social democrat. So <clears throat> what's the problem? There, I may John? vote for them if I can, if, <laughs> well, I can, if I can believe, you know, who knows? You just but don't know. But the thing is, is that there's a problem there, is it that they are just not offing, offering any real tangible difference from the ruling elites. The NDP are all excited about trying to act like <coughs> the liberals for some reason. Nobody likes the liberals, so what, why are they doing that? But I, I think really, well, like you said with uh, this article, uh, <coughs> you see on and on it goes in an editorial pages with these major editorialists writing these sort of backward and lame articles with no real credibility with any real facts or anything. Now, uh, you know, just, just to move on, maybe do you want to talk a little bit more about this? Because, because I, I can give several examples here just in, the, in another paper. Uh, stifling real uh, opinions, uh, differing opinions, and I think you know it's so important to have everybody offer, have the chance to offer an opinion on all the major topics. You, like you and I, will disagree on a lot of things, but you, I'm always very interested in what you have to say, and and we all should be like that. But in our new, in our weeklies now, which are owned by one person, and all Vancouver Island, all our weeklies are owned by one person. Uh, we have a case here where, uh, on in the viewpoint, we have oil price drop could have negative effects in our Canadian economy, and it says in fact it's going to have negative effects. Seems to me when energy prices go down, everybody should be happy about that, shouldn't they? Well, we're an oil-producing nation. The pro problem with us is that we're producing the dirtiest fuel in the world, and the most expensive fuel to produce. Oil companies are just doing it to maintain some type of facade that they have a reserve, which they don't really have. As long as those tar sands sit there and they keep digging that stuff out of the ground, oil companies can pretend that they're, they're solvent, but they're not going to be because they don't have reserves. On the other side of the, of the editorial page, something that's a little more dear to my heart is a, a, an issue about the smart meter program, and which another editorialist, well-known in the province, uh, is stating that uh, that the Ontario Auditor General says the BC uh, smart meter program was a good model. Okay, so the headline, the That's headline what it says, says, BC smart meter program, good model, Ontario Auditor. Well, it sounds like she's congratulating us out here for doing something right. Well, in fact, she isn't. She says the smart meter program cost the Ontario government at least a billion dollars. It's not saved any money, any money anywhere, it hasn't saved any energy. But what she's saying is that the BC model, which was uh, the, uh, where they they uh, analyzed the, the market very carefully and and they knew how it was going to go before they proceeded, uh, and I guess she just buys exactly whatever they said about the program out here. You know, we have the the Enron bookkeeping out here, the BC Hydro, who just developed the the craziest bookkeeping system in the world. Uh, making statements about how good a deal the <laughs> BC Power Smart Pro or the uh, Smart Meter Program is. The Smart Meter Program is an absolute disgrace. <laughs> yeah. That they, I mean, f this was completely top down. This is a worldwide program. Yeah. It was forced onto BC Hydro by, I, I guess, first Gordon Campbell and then Christy Clark. I mean, Hydro is, is, of course, the people who run Hydro have got to do what they're told, but they're told what to do by the people who run this province. And the public was never asked. They were for we, we were forced to put these poisonous things on our homes, a cost of a billion dollars for nothing. The media silent in their approval of allowing it to happen. I mean, where was, it, where was the referendum on smart media? Yeah, where Jack? was the referendum <laughs> on smart? Now, my understanding is that in Germany, they've decided not to do smart meters. Am I right or am I wrong? Lots of jurisdictions all around the world have it, how about Germany? back and forth. I don't know about Germany okay, yet. I've heard they are not moving ahead with smart yeah. meters in Germany. If, I mean, it's crazy. These, we're, our, our leadership, or not our leadership, our corporate puppet politicians are completely out of control. 
They yeah. are controlled by the same people who control the media. The corporations, or, or whoever it is that runs this country, control both all the political parties, basically, and yeah. all the big media. When one small group mm. of very crazy people has that much power, only disaster can follow, and we're seeing it all over the world. Well, you know, it's, it's, it, whenever a story is really big and really important, I guarantee you, you're not going to find out about it in, in the corporate media. Like the Imperial Mines disaster, uh, you know, up in the interior when that massive, massive lake of toxic chemicals flooded into the, into the headwaters of the, of the Fraser River and with devastating consequences for decades. Hardly a word is said about it. Even the smart meter program, the major, major criticism of the smart meter program was the radiation coming off these meters, which are coming off the meters all the time, all day, every day. And that's the truth, that's the science. And that type of radiation it impacts health negatively. That's the science, you can't get around it. You know, they're strapping a cell phone right on the side of your house, but the signal it's, the, it's punching out is much more powerful, much more penetrating into human tissue. Devastating story, but we don't read about it. Somehow we can't find out about that. Somehow it's, we can't talk about it. And you know, just to kind of move on and stay on the same terms of what we're talking about, uh, we had discussed this very briefly before the show about um, Alexandra Morton and her efforts to try to clean up the the uh, salmon farming business in this province. Again, owned by a very few people, absolutely com and completely is known to be killing salmon by the millions in their own pens and all the wild stock, and a very w wide, wide amount of the wild stock are now dying. But you know, we can't find out about that. We can't, you know, we try, we look, we look in the corporate media, not a word being said. And we could go on and on about these major stories that are going to have impacts on this province and on this planet for decades to come. Issues about planetary survival. You know, we can't read it in the corporate media. It seems to be some kind of limbo that they live in. And we have these mouthpieces, the same guys, on and on they go, talking about, oh, electoral reform is such a terrible idea. I mean, it, it is so stifling. And, and really, truly, after a while, the public begins to accept that they are second class. They don't deserve the truth. And what you're, ta what you're saying about planetary survival is exactly where we're at right now. And I've gotten a few emails today from people who are saying, why do we keep hearing about this dentistry thing at whatever university is back east with, with these you know, yeah. stupid comments? I mean, why is that the national news when there are so... I mean, it, it, we are at a stage of planetary survival right now. Yeah. And as you say, we can't seem to find out about it. I sent out a, a, an email about, called, Is the Canadian Media Lying About ISIS? And it's exactly the same thing. I mean, we don't have time to talk about the fact that we don't have a democracy, we don't have time to talk about the fact that all our food is genetically contaminated. There's a, a new study that came out from some university in the state says that cancer is just by accident. It's got nothing to do with devastation of the environment and the radiation. It's just by accident. That got a lot of play in the media. Yeah. You know, we're, we're just, we're just stuck in this limbo and you know ISIS is they've created ISIS just like Western the one percent of the one percent funded Adolf Hitler and the Nazis money run through a, a bank in which the father and grandfather of George the George's Bush the president Senator Prescott Bush was a director of a bank that was funneling money from the United States to fund Hitler and the Nazis when, when they were just getting started, the corporate media will not report this. The corporate media will not report this. At the same moment in time that they've created the next enemy now, which is ISIS, and people are saying, hey, that's being funded through the United States and its allies. They've created ISIS. They're funding ISIS. I mean, we're living in this 
insane world created by a small ruling class who obviously will happily kill us all well, for you their know, own it, benefit. You know, it, I, it, it really is curious because it, we're in an information overload society. Everybody's walking around with cell phones and all these apps and computers. You can look up almost anything on the computer, apparently. But um, there's no... The, People are, don't have those critical thinking skills that are necessary for a democracy. Uh, and they, they have so, they're sort of lulled into some kind of submission that is very strange. They act very uh, childish. You know, when I talk to a lot of people, like lawyers and doctors and professionals, university professors, people that should be on the ball here and really clicking on these issues, no. You're not getting anything from these guys. They're they're deadheads, and these are the professionals that we're relying on to kind of steer society somewhat. What we have in the past, well, they're not there anymore. These people have sold us out. Uh, the whole class of the professional elites, for the most part, have rushed to sell us out. Jack, we're in such trouble with them. There's no real criticism going on, and it's it's kind of like the job has fallen on our laps and other citizens to try to pick up the slack as best we can. Yeah, so you're saying there should be more coming out of, for example, our universities and really leading the attack back against the, yeah. the corporate takeover of our democracy. No, as a good example is, and I hope we can get this up on the screen, is uh, uh, Alexander is Morton's new uh, documentary called Salmon Confidential. And it does look at, they do show quite a few of these people uh, quite a few uh, Department of Fisheries officials and stuff, and uh, watch the video. Make up your own mind. So watch the documentary. Salmon. Salmon con confidential, but she does lay out straightforward lies that the Department of Fisheries have told, and uh, there are some uh, scientists, some some of the professors and such have stood up and and you know insisted on having the truth be told. So not all have done it. But what's so, so important is that, that those people not cower and worry about they're going to lose their jobs. Or okay, so but from where we are now, I mean, the, the sad fact is that everybody in the bureaucracy is afraid. People are afraid of losing yeah. their jobs because the people at the top are corrupt. So here we are, here we all are. How do we start to move ahead to, to fix the massive problems that we've got to deal with? Well, we have to become aware, of course, but we have to be interested in becoming aware. And I, I, when I talk to a lot of people, I realize, oh my gosh, like they're out of it. They're not only uh, don't have an opinion on the subject, they never heard about it. Well, that's our failing. That's the failing yeah. of, of all of us on, on this, you know, this side of the spectrum yeah. who, are, who, 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 who oppose the corporate monolith. Yeah. We have failed. We've allowed the corporations to completely take over all the media in our country. And of course, they use it to give people uh, false impressions about what's going on. Well, you know, I think if at we some have point media, we should talk more about the psychology of And I don't mean we, but if, if, if you create an independent media, yeah. I mean, we've got to have it. So we've got to have it. But why are people selling out? I mean, you, you talk about the fear and all that. But the bottom line is that we've got some serious issues. Our very survival is depending upon our actions. You know, it's not just maybe not getting a raise or maybe not being promoted or something. No, it's talking about civilizations in, in trouble. They should get past those things and realize that there are more important things in their lives. Make their lives significant. You know, be, be significant, take some Well, steps. people have done that. There was a, a Dr. Shiv Chopra. Who, oh, yeah. But nobody's ever heard of him. I mean, the media yeah. completely covered over the story of a Canadian hero, a man who worked for Health Canada, and yeah. who refused to sign off on the lies that Health Canada wanted ab about, I think it was about genetically engineered foods and, 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 and yeah. pesticides. I don't remember what the specific issue was, but he wouldn't do it. They fired him. Yeah. The media completely covered up the story. Does anybody know the name Shiv Chopra? And there, was, there were two or three others as well, I think. I mean, I don't even know the story because you never hear about it. Yeah, so, you have to I mean, be almost a lesson, be a fanatic. What know? a lesson that was to everybody else in yeah. the government about what, you know, they say you can't get fired from government. Well, you can. You just try to do the right thing. 
and yeah. Harper and Christy Clark and all the rest of them will fire you immediately. Well, you know, a lot of people I met, and I met a lot of, a lot of uh, people from all over the political spectrum opposing smart meters, people that took the time to learn about the evidence of harm, uh, and the health implications and the crazy economics of it and all that. All that. But, you know, and, and I was convinced, okay, this is, this is a real, you know, the highest form of corruption you can get in a government. But if you look at the, uh, the, how they're treating salmon in this province, it's right up there. It's just as corrupt. And those people are so willing to sell us out, Jack. That's what is so curious to me. I mean, it, 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 the stakes are so high. And, and they're still well, willing to do it. We've, we've all got to do more. We've all got to do more. Exactly. I mean, I think, and I know others think it as well, is there is a plan to get rid of the salmon. Because yeah. when you have the salmon, you have, an, you have a reason why you don't want tankers plying the waters, because you want to protect the ecosystems. Once the salmon are gone, you know, and the fishermen are gone, then the, the opposition to the oil industry is weakened. I think... You know, they're saying, you know, the, the island communities, the Gulf Island communities yeah. are in big trouble now. Well, who else opposes the oil industry and the extraction industry? It's, it's you know, the people there don't want it. They don't want those yeah. tankers going through their islands. So the islands are under attack. They will be weakened, and it's deliberate. That's the way these people play the game. And yeah. we're all next. Anyway, I just want to uh, urge people to watch this documentary. It's really quite startling. I just watched it last night, and I, I've seen parts of this footage before, but all put together, what a story. And it's so compelling, and it just, it just puts all those pieces together. Of all the things we have to change, we have to change our bureaucracies. We can't allow these people to continue on. And the name, again, of the documentary? Salmon Confidential. Salmon Confidential. Thank you, Walter. No problem, Jack. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum, being filmed on Tuesday, January the 6th in the Memorial Arena. I forgot in the first segment to say Happy New Year. I think it's going to be a remarkable year, um, and I guess we'll see what happens. Our guest in this segment is Saanich City Councillor Vic Derman. And Vic, you're Saanich City Councillor, plus you're on the CRD. I'm a CRD director, yeah. I think you've been, I don't want to embarrass you, but one of the, one of the great people on the sewage issue for years. Oh, thank you, Jack. And I think I can, s I mean, I've always thought that you've tried to take us in a direction of just trying to make the best possible decisions uh, on this billion dollar issue. And, and unfortunately, that isn't the way things have worked out, but maybe we're getting closer now. Well, uh, the door isn't closed. We still have opportunity. Um, there will be a first meeting of the new year, the core area committee, the liquid, the sewage committee, tomorrow morning. Um, we'll see what happens from there. I'm optimistic. I hope that we can uh, start to move in the right direction. So what is the right direction given where we are right now? Uh, well, the right direction always has been to do your due diligence and homework at the start, to open the process up, invite the best and brightest ideas in, uh, and then start to see how they might be applied uh, in our situation. Uh, I think the right direction is also to say this should not be seen as simply a sewage treatment project. It should be seen as an urban sustainability project. We need to move locally and globally to a much more sustainable approach. <laughs> There's things like climate change out there, and they're very, very serious. So this project should have started out by saying what are our real goals, and obviously one is to treat sewage, that's a given, uh, but it should have been to maximize the response to climate change in the manner we do things. It should have been to maximize resource recovery and maximize local environmental benefit as well as global environmental benefit. Those kinds of things should have been established. Then when we di did that we should have said, okay, now we've done that, let's open it up and let's see what are the very best and brightest ideas out there and let's see how we can fit them into what we need to do. Okay, so all of that makes, to me, complete and 100% total sense. So I assume that's what was done because this whole sewage treatment project for the last, it seems like eight years or however long it's been, has been run by very highly paid senior staff throughout 
the city and the CRD and overseen by many city councillors. But my understanding is that none of what you said has, has been done. Instead, a plan was imposed upon us which was out of date eight years ago and uh, overly expensive yeah. and no, of no benefit to the environment. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, an, an environmental assessment, a net environmental gain assessment was never done. Uh, it should have been. So it's, it's not easy to say it was no environment or no benefit, but it was probably less than optimal benefit compared to what it could have been. Uh, no, the, the, the approach I'm suggesting that I hope we now take really has never taken place fully uh, or even very partially. Uh, there are a whole variety of reasons for that. One is that you know, people tend to approach things from silos. You know, I'm doing a sewage treatment project. I'm do building a highway to so, or, without looking into the entire context of the urban area and saying, okay, is this fit with what we're trying to accomplish in this area for the future? Uh, it tends to be a, a kind of an isolated approach to one aspect of, of, of the bigger issue of, of uh, a sustainable future. And in fact, an attractive future uh, for a region that provides the best possible quality of life, for example, that, that we can get. Um, those kinds of big, big goals should be established and we should be putting everything through those as a lens to make sure that what we do is accomplishing those things. Yeah, well I agree. I, I, I wish you guys and gals, uh, what do I wish? I mean, it, it's, it's Vic, Common it's sense and reason. <laughs> it's hard to have faith in the system, I mean, because for the most part, it's probably a lot of the same people who got us into this mess in the first place. Um, you know, I, I don't really see them as bad people. Um, Neither do I. You know, uh, in, in most cases, reasonably intelligent people and reasonably well-intentioned, they get stuck into a position, uh, you know, and they probably get stuck there by not doing that due diligence and homework to start with, by looking at the thing rather myopically, uh, by fixating on a solution that hasn't been tested against other possible solutions, and they kind of get a position of ownership on it, uh, you know, and, and it's easy for that to happen. And it's hard for people to back away and say, oh, wait a minute, maybe the time spent and the money spent was wrong, and maybe it's time that we, we, we went elsewhere. Well, there's got to be a very very bright spotlight I think shone on the decisions that are going to be made and you know I don't think that happens either I, I fault our media our city's media for not um, giving I, us I, in, I in my know, opinion. Jack. I've been on know, here okay. with in, you a number of times yeah. um, I've been on CFAX radio innumerable times I've written editorials or op-eds for the TC and other newspapers uh, it's been in Focus magazine on several occasions. Um, it, it's very hard to get people to look at that spotlight sometimes. They have busy lives, they have all sorts of interests, uh, and I think human nature is such, until something comes and bites you in the backside and your taxes go way up or something else undesirable happens, they don't the average person doesn't tend to pay a, little, a lot of attention, I'll especially say, I'll if say, they perceive. Let's let's ask everybody in this city if they know who Luca Magnata is, and ask everybody how many times did we hear the word dismember over the past six or eight months because yeah. of the trial of, of this murderer. The, the media, I think, chooses to create certain important stories and fills people's minds with them and yet the vitally important issues of the future of our city, they kind, it, it just doesn't happen. But you know, well, well, the situations are simple. Yeah. If the media would have reported, or, you know, and really made well, an it, issue it, of it, it. It did at times. Uh, Rob Shaw at, uh, at TC ran several big articles uh, when he had that beat uh, about, you know, what was going on and concerns he had and things of that nature. I think you hit on one of the issues when you mentioned the word future. You know, people look around today and things are operating reasonably well. There are some issues. We've got more and more traffic congestion, for example. Huge. Uh, you know, and it's getting worse all the time.
But by and large, they're pretty satisfied with the way things are going. Um, that's I kind don't of like know saying, if that's true. well, in a lot of cases it is, because I go out and door knock during campaigns, okay. and I hear a lot of that. Uh, it's kind of like saying, I'm sailing on the Titanic, and gee, it's a calm night, and the ocean's pretty smooth, and I think it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, well, maybe not. Uh, it, it's harder for people to look, and it's hard to catch people's attention. And this is the issue with climate change. You know, yeah, we're becoming aware of the fact, I think, that it's hitting now. You know, we're seeing more severe weather events. We're seeing a variety of other things, uh, big effects in the Arctic and so forth. But for most people, their world hasn't changed dramatically. And so they don't kind of focus on it. People tend to focus on something when it's dramatic. And, uh, dismemberment, unfortunately, is very dramatic. Or they focus on it when it's a big threat, an obvious immediate threat. And uh, we're talking about things, uh, you know, down the road. And, and it's harder to get people's attention. I think you do after time. I think more and more people are aware of the sewage project. I, I think it had a big effect on the last election. You know, uh, those who had supported it didn't do as well overall. Some did, but, uh, but a lot didn't. So let's move on to, um, I mean, there was a big story out of Saanich, I guess, what, two or three weeks ago now, yep. um, about the, I, I don't even know what word to use, the chief administrative officer, uh, the senior, I guess, yeah. bureaucrat or civil servant? The, the head of staff, essentially. Okay. Was, I don't know what word to use. Maybe you can tell us what happened yeah okay sure um, what happened was the mayor-elect uh, went to, into uh, Mr. Murray's office Mr. Paul Murray who was CAO uh, before he was sworn in actually and it, with his own personal lawyer in tow it appeared and at least as what's being reported broadly in the media and said uh, to the CAO that he wasn't happy with him continuing employment, I believe, and, and asked for his resignation. Uh, as has been reported in the media, uh, and I presume that's accurate. Uh, I've had a similar thing said to me by the, the mayor himself. Um, and that, of course, launched all sorts of things. Uh, first now, you've been in city government for a long time. Is this something that a mayor, a mayor or a mayor-elect could or should do? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. First of all, the mayor-elect has no powers. Um, people realize, of course, the mayor-elect will become mayor after a period of time. But uh, until you're sworn in, you effectively have the power of, a, of an every ordinary citizen, you know, as any other citizen would. Um, so certainly on that basis, uh, no, as mayor-elect, you don't have that power at all. And secondly, even when you're sworn in as mayor, you don't have that power. The chief administrative officer is hired by council, and only council can decide to terminate or accept the individual's resignation or whatever it happens to be. So that being the case, um, should it, because I know it costs, I guess it costs the people of Saanich half a million dollars. Final cost we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, we'll have to have an interim CAO. Um, they tend to come at a premium because they're on a short-term basis and so forth. So, so we'll see. But it, it's certainly in that range. So then, so the the mayor-elect uh, says something to the uh, chief administrative officer of Saanich that, you know, I guess I don't I don't like you or, or, or whatever. Um, but if the council couldn't the council have just said, well, you know, there's eight, well, eight to one. We want to keep you on. You and have an issue. Um, they. The issue is, what is the mayor supposed to be in terms of the municipality? And the mayor, one of the mayor's chief functions, is probably the most important one, is to serve as the liaison between council and the CAO, to bring council's will to the CAO and work with the CAO to make sure that council's will is carried out. And on the other hand, bring things back from the CAO if there needs to be a bylaw, that, you know, a staff bill or something of that nature, and make sure it's brought to council. That became very difficult. Their offices, by the way, in Senate are right next door to each other. You know, uh, 
and for that very reason. That became very difficult in Saanich because the relationship, as I understand it, had been damaged to the degree in what was said and what was done that it would have been very hard for them to work together. Yeah. So then maybe it makes sense, even, even at a cost of half a million dollars, for, well, but if the council was happy, you know, it, it's really the yeah, council. It, it, yeah, it's a, now, you know. I don't know if there, the council there was is, happy. There is a, a process. It's not unknown for a CAO to leave after an election, usually six months to a year after. Uh, and it may be the new council wishes a change, um, and, and that happens. But there is a process. You usually do a performance review. Um, you look at, you know, the history of yeah. what the individual's done, whether it's satisfactory, whether it isn't, and so forth. Uh, if there are generally satisfying things and there are a few weaknesses, you try to offer courses or training to, to fix those up and things of that nature. Uh, there is an expectation there will be proper process. There wasn't, you know, at all. Uh, and that was, uh, I think, very surprising and, in my view, very, very unfortunate. Uh, it created, uh, I think, considerable damage uh, to Saanich and its taxpayers. Uh, you had the damage of cost. Uh, you had the damage of uh, a lack, perhaps lack of confidence in the part of staff and, and you know, wondering about how things are going to be dealt with in Saanich. Uh, you now, I've also heard I, I heard once somewhere in the media that there were a lot of problems in the civil service in Saanich that were becoming... Mm, not unusually, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge. We're, you know, we're a corporation with something in the neighborhood of twelve to 1,600 employees. Uh, often there will be issues here and there, but I wasn't aware of anything okay. dramatically so. Uh, but another problem it has is this has cost Saanich reputation. The manner in which this happened will become known throughout the province and, in fact, throughout Canada. Uh, it, people talk to each other. You know. uh, we always want to, at Saanich, try to attract the very best we can, to, especially for senior staff. You know, it, it makes a big difference. Uh, if people are not confident that Saanich carries things out in an appropriate manner, it's going to be hard for us to attract. Why would somebody come if they feel that's the way they'll be dealt with? You know, uh, yeah. I mean, so, I, I, so either you have see, to... As, as an average citizen, I have no... I mean, I lived in Saanich for many, many years, and I, I guess I lived in Saanich at the time when this gentleman was, was the CAO for, for, for some years. Um, I have no idea what he was doing. I don't know if he was doing a good job, not a good job. I don't know if Saanich... I mean, the, the, the few... You know, I mean, well, uh, we didn't have uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of significant concerns right. that I know of, uh, but you know that comes back to the fact that this was not something that is the authority of right. the mayor to do, and most certainly when he is the mayor elect, right. um, and, and uh, it left council in a situation where there weren't a lot of good choices. Okay. And, and I think council expressed that. Okay. You know, it's pretty unusual after a week and a half or two weeks to have council vote, eight, all eight councillors vote in favour of a motion that says they are not satisfied with the manner in which the mayor has acted. Yeah, I guess to get eight councillors to agree on anything is pretty difficult. Uh, well, you know, it happens, it happens, but that's a pretty dramatic one for it to happen on. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Sure. Um, we maybe land use and transportation we've got one minute left I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah it, well those are those Important are topics issues. those are huge topics I mean there are all sorts of them we have huge problems we have huge opportunities and I'd love to talk about those sometime in the future I mean look at traffic traffic is due to the land use choices we have made in the past there are no traffic eggs you know that suddenly hatch and out comes new traffic uh, the new traffic comes from the choices we have made in the past and how we have done things. Uh, we need to learn from that and make sure we do them correctly in the future. We have at the CRD very good traffic modeling software. I've had a role in getting it down there. 
uh, it will tell us that if we don't change what we do within 15 years maximum probably, we turn the island highway into a very large, fairly slow moving parking lot. You know, uh, we need to avoid that. You know, we absolutely do, but that's another topic. Yeah. Hopefully for another time. Vic Durman, thank you very much. Thank you, and could I wish your viewers uh, an excellent new year. I hope it all goes well for them. Thanks, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to the last segment of Citizens Forum being filmed on Tuesday, January the 6th, 2015. Uh, I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that uh, makes this show possible. Our guest in this segment is Vicky Chi. Vicky is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner mm -hmm. and we're going to be talking and sh and we're going to be talking about health in the wintertime from a Chinese medicine point of view. And so the first question is, yes. how can we help the body mm -hmm. with healing in the winter? And what is the connection between the body and wintertime? Thank you, Jack. Uh, in ancient time, uh, when Chinese medicine uh, was forming in the very, very beginning. I think our ancestors observed the nature to and think of the body. And they realized the body is just a small, small part of the big nature. And that's why they gradually, from thousand years, they realize the body has to follow the nature to make help the body do better job. If the body do something which is against the nature, then we will have some problem. And that's why uh, in ancient Chinese medicine, we realize there are four seasons, okay? And the body actually follow, has to follow the four seasons to help the body to do better and to be healthier. So, so it, each season connected to different system of the body. Spring connected to liver. Summer connected to heart. Fall connected to lungs. And uh, winter connected to kidney, okay? So that means in each season, we can do better job for different organ to help the body get healthier and health and stay healthy. Uh, and the, but why kidney? So today we, I'm going to talk about the winter because it's winter now. Okay, so, so, so why kidneys connect to winter, okay? And actually a kidney, kidney in Chinese medicine is the deepest level of the body. So maybe the most important system of the body. Yes, which is the root of the life like uh, the trees, the plants, yeah, the root. If the root die, then not, not the tree will die, okay? But in winter, when we see the tree, sometimes when we see the, a tree, the tree, is, the tree look like dead. But when spring come, comes back, right? And the, the tree, started to be alive. Yeah, that means the tree, the tree is not die, it's not dying. Yeah, it's still alive. And lots of, the, because the root is still alive. That's why the tree won't die. And kidney actually is the root of life. That's why, that's why winter time, it's very important to 
take better care of kidney to heal the kidney problem, okay, to get the, the body root be healthier because kidney support each organ, support each system. For example, for people who has asthma, okay, actually we think it's not lung prob only lung problem, it's also kidney problem. The root is kidney because kidney has to work together with lung for breathing, for, for breathing. So kidney has to hold the energy from lung to kidney and then we won't have short breath or asthma. So for asthma, we have to treat kidney uh, more than lung, okay? F make uh, another example how, why kidney is so important. For people who has heart beat very fast, okay, palpitation, actually in Chinese medicine, we think that kidney sunshine energy is so weak, too weak to support the heart. That's why heart has to say, help me, help me by beat, beating very, very fast. And this condition we have to treat kidney. And some people go check with doctor, even though their heart has so speed so fast, but the, the result from doctor is your heart has no problem. They couldn't find any problem. Actually, it's not a heart problem. It's the kidney sunshine energy too weak. Okay, I just make a couple example to to let you know to let know uh, how how kidney important. how important the kidney is. Yeah, so that's why. Mm -hmm. What can we do mm -hmm. to help the kidney? Yes. Be stronger. Yes. Actually, uh, when why kidney con connected to winter? Okay, as I said, it's the root. Also, uh, because in winter it's so cold, and the nothing grow, and everything seems close and very quiet. Okay, and uh, so the body, because the body has to follow the nature, everything go back to root to nourish the root. That's why in winter we have to also do less. Okay, and uh, and be be more or uh, more quiet. Yeah, and. Uh, to go back to kidney. That's why, that's the reason uh, why uh, a kidney connect to winter, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when, you, when your kidney function work properly, when your kidneys are warmer, then you will like the winter, you will enjoy the winter. Um, you think winter is fine, it's okay, yeah, I, I can go through. But if your kidney are very cold already, uh, n no much sunshine energy there, then you you will experience some problem. For example, so you've mentioned warm and cold a couple yes. of times now. Yes. And I know that in your style of Chinese medicine, keeping the body warm is very very important. very very important. Yes. Yes. And if what you call cold energy is yes. allowed to get a, a foothold in the body, uh -huh. that cold energy or that cold in the body will create problems. Yes. And the the treatment is to warm the body up and yes. push the cold energy out. Yes. Yes. If your kidney uh, are cold, in winter you will suffer. Suffer. You have more problem or or problem worse, including pain problem. Okay, or any kind of pain problem, or heart problem, okay, or asthma, got worse in winter, yeah, and or some people skin problem, okay, or you feel very very cold, you just cannot take take the cold anymore, yeah, you don't you won't like 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 winter, yeah, that is because your kidney temperature is quite low, okay, lack of sunshine energy. Mm -hmm. So, so what? What in uh, terms of diet? Yeah, actually, uh, I haven't answered your last question. Sorry, uh, your question is what we can do. What is the most important thing we can do in winter to help kidney? Okay, heating. 
as you just say, keep the body as warm as you can. Yeah, by putting on lots of clothes, scarf, tuque, socks, okay, and uh, and even extra pants, okay. Yeah, this will protect your body. But some people might say, oh, I don't feel cold at all. Yeah, I feel hot even, right? Yeah, actually, if 10 persons say it's cold, only two persons say, I don't feel cold. And that's the two person problem. So the two person has, we call the sunshine energy floating to the surface level. And that's why they don't feel too cold. So I know that means that the body's core energy, its core warmth. Inside too ins cold. Yeah, instead of being in the organs where it should be. Yes. The organs aren't strong enough to hold it, and so the warmth goes up Go into to the, the surface. surface. You feel warm, Yes. but deeper in the body, there's the problem. Yes, some problem growing there, okay, hiding there. Yeah, and the, and the, the, the person who has floating sunshine energy outside, usually the face will look redder, yeah, and they feel hot and easy to sweat, yeah, yeah. which is not good. I just want to say I've been here for 30 years now, mm -hmm. more than 30 years in Victoria, and it took me a long, long time, and it's just in the last couple of years that I finally realized that if you buy the right clothes, you can yeah. be warm and dry and very comfortable and happy yes. in the winter time. Yes. So I recommend it to everybody. They're not necessarily expensive clothes, yes. but you've got to have, you know, a, something with a, a good hood, a good rain jacket, mm. good good shoes and boots yes. to keep your feet dry, Yes. warm clothes, uh, it makes yes. a difference. Sometimes on the street, I can see some young people, they wear a scarf, I mean skirt, oh. okay, oh. or short pants, yeah, some young people. Actually, uh, in Chinese medicine, the cold energy will start from feet, from, from the, the bottom of the body, and then go into your system okay and through the meridians and go to into your organ and the cold energy can stay in inside your organ for years mm -hmm. and diet i know is important so yes. i for example have stopped drinking ever cold water and when i go to a restaurant they put ice water on the table mm -hmm. uh, because i know now and i believe it that uh, yes. warm warmth is important especially just before you eat Yes. To throw a bit of ice water into your digestive system is Which probably is not, not good. Yeah, uh, I would suggest a diet in winter. Let's do a seventy percent warm cooked food, and uh, if you really like salad or raw vegetable, you can do maybe thirty percent uh, salad. But after you eat a uh, warm food, you eat a salad. Okay, so salad you eat a salad after you eat a warm food. And you can also can uh, no and of course no cold water, no ice water, and no cold drink better. And uh, you can add some ginger, some spice like uh, uh, cloves, fennel, okay, or uh, cinnamon or curry into your diet. Cook cook a soup. Eat a more uh, rice soup in winter, which which will be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, we were just at a party where um, there was some ginger tea. It was ginger and lemon tea. Yes, yes. And all she did was cut from fairly big pieces of ginger yes. uh, up and some lemon, organic. Yes. Um, put them in a pot with some water, boil yeah. it up for a while, and we had a delicious ginger tea. And ginger, yeah, a very simple good. ginger, is mm -hmm. perhaps the most warming yes. medicine in Chinese medicine. Exactly. Very, very important medicine in Chinese medicine. Okay, we don't use garlic, we don't use onion in Chinese medicine, but we use a lot of ginger, okay? And also in winter, we have to eat less salt, less salt and more bitter, bitter vegetables, like a root vegetable, like a turnip, okay? Bitter, better in winter, but less salt. And, and this way, uh, kidney can help more, uh, more your heart because heart like a bitter, okay? But if you eat too much salt in winter, it will weaken your kidney 
and then kidney cannot help heart. Okay, yeah, so, so less salt and the more bitter vegetable, like a root vegetable. We say eat root to nourish your root. Okay, do you have any other question, Jack? Exercise. Oh, okay. I think we do need a regular exercise in winter, but I, I would suggest more indoors exercise especially when it's really cold, windy, and rainy. Because if your body is not strong enough to defense your body, then you will catch lots of cold energy into your system. And the cold energy will stay inside, hiding there for years to cause problems when you are older. So I know that in your style of Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. the for a wide variety of problems, mm -hmm. the treatment is basically the same. You give herbs to warm the body up, mm -hmm. and you give herbs to open the, the, the pores and the various doors of the body, yes. and you try to move the cold energy out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, Because the nature is, the body just wanted to be warm as warm as it can be. When the body is cold, nothing work. Nothing work very good. Yeah. I make an example. The baby is so warm, the newborn baby, but when we die, what's the temperature of the body? It's ice cold. That make me think, yes, the body wanted to be as warm as you can. If your body warmer enough, then you will stay, you will be healthier and healthier, yeah. You can reverse your, your health, actually. That's, yeah, and that's a very important thing. I, I think mm. at virtually any age, you can become healthier and stronger through oh. good diet and exercise, yeah. taking care of yourself. Jack, I have one more thing, very important, I wanted to say. Go to bed, in winter, go to bed earlier and get up late. You can sleep longer in winter. Okay, that's very, very important. Yeah, means rest, rest more and do less and less activity, except, the, of course, except the Christmas time. <laughs> uh, Vicky Chi, thank you very much. Let's all stay warm through 2015. Thank you for watching Citizens Forum this week. Mm -hmm.